Thank you very much. So now I'd like to kind of turn it over to the next panel, the enterprise's role in securing sustainable mortgages, how appropriate uh, given where we just ended. Um, and I think we'll just kind of keep the conversation going. So this panel is going to be moderated by Ann McCullough, one of my old colleagues from uh, Fannie Mae. This is a little bit of a Fannie Mae day with David Dorkin. I saw Katrina Jones on the first panel. So uh, Anne, it's great to be able to, to see you. So a little bit about Ann McCullough, President and CEO of Housing Partnership Equity and Trust. Um, Anne joined HPET in 2017. And prior to that, uh, devoted 18 years of her career at Fannie Mae. I think I overlapped for 15 of that with her, uh, where she served mostly as Senior Vice President of Credit and Housing Access. Um, before that, she was Deputy General Counsel or Deputy General Counsel for Fannie Mae's multifamily um, business, where she led a legal team and $200 billion book of rental housing debt and equity investments. So, Anne, welcome. It is great to see you. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Christy. I'm so inspired by the panel you just had. It, it was the perfect lead in because I agree, we are at a moment where everyone is together focused on home ownership. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, we're excited with, uh, about today's panel. Uh, we'll be talking about the role of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and FHA in creating sustainable mortgage credit. And we have the experts. Uh, so let me introduce them to you. Uh, we have Ted Wartell, who's Associate Director of the Office of Housing and Community Investment at the Federal Housing Finance Ag Agency. And Ted has long been a thoughtful policy leader in government. He's held leadership roles at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency at the Small Business Administration and at the Office of Management and Budget. He's also been a thought leader and agent for change on the private sector side, uh, serving as Chief of Staff for Community Lending at Fannie Mae. He's a graduate of Northwestern and has a Master's of Public Policy from the University of Chicago. Continuing our Chicago theme, um, we also have Mark McArdle, who's the Assistant Director for Mortgage Markets at the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. His office has responsibility within the Bureau for monitoring, analyzing, and engaging with the mortgage industry and all its diverse players. Uh, and he's involved in all the good stuff. Uh, Humda, the ability to repay, qualified mortgage rules. Uh, for all of us housing geeks, it really is the stuff that has us on the edge of our seat. So I'm looking forward to what Mark has to say. He's also held leadership roles at the Department of Treasury, where he had, I think, the best title in housing. He was Chief Home Ownership Preservation Officer. Great title. Uh, and he's also served on the ground with community groups, including the Bowery Residence Committee, which is the second largest homeless services provider in New York City, uh, as well as having uh, research and leadership roles at the National Urban League and the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. He too is a graduate of the University of Chicago. Uh, with a master's in urban planning from the University of Wisconsin. And then we have joining us Lopa Kalori from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, Lopa is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing at FHA uh, and previously was the Chief Development and Operating Officer at the Philadelphia Housing Authority following a long career at Penrose, HUD, and Community Investment Strategies, as well as having served in state government in New Jersey. Uh, she's a graduate of Kenyon and has a master's in public policy from American University. Let me turn it over to each of the panelists to give an opening uh, couple of remarks, and then we'll get the conversation started. So let me start with Lopa first. Thank you, Anne, for that uh, great introduction. Um, and let me just thank uh, David Dorkin and the National Housing Conference for putting this panel together on a topic that I know that we all feel very passionate about. Um, and so this is my uh, uh, second tour at HUD, and I previously served as a Deputy Chief of Staff for HUD Secretary Sean Donovan. And so I've had the privilege of, of working for, for HUD before um, and for several housing related organizations, as you mentioned, Anne, in the, in the both the private and public sector. 
um, at the local and national levels. Um, and, but it was really my early role, uh, I think, at Fannie Mae Foundation, where I was involved in a broad range of home ownership issues, including anti-predatory lending, the importance of home ownership counseling, and home buyer education that really led me to where I am today. And so HUD and its mission has always had a very special place for me. Um, I was honored to return, uh, honored to be asked to return again once to HUD under Secretary Fudge this time to lead the Office of Housing and Federal Housing Administration. Um, so oh, a little bit about how uh, the Office of Housing and FHA. So the Office of Housing has seven program offices, which include the Office of Housing Counseling, the Office of Manufactured Housing, and three FHA insurance programs that we insure mortgages for single family homes, multifamily properties, as well as, as, well as healthcare facilities. So to give you a better scope um, on the single family side, as of July, we had active insurance on 7.5 million single family Ford mortgages. And that's a total unpaid principal balance of $1.2 trillion. Um, and then our reverse mortgage force insurance portfolio under our HECM program, our home equity conversion mortgage program for seniors, we have approximately 415,000 mortgages. Uh, we also insure mortgages for more than 11,000 multifamily properties and approximately 3,900 residential care facilities and hospitals. So, so the numbers provide some context of, of where we are today, but as an industry, as a nation, as individuals, we must recognize that the benefits ho of home ownership, which I know is the focus of our panel today in America is not reaching everyone. And for FHA, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on homeowners um, with FHA insured mortgages, you know, kind of brings a whole new moon, meaning to sustainable home ownership for now, now and, and for the years, the next few years to come. Um, so at HUD, we are focused on addressing the housing challenges that head on. President Biden and HUD Secretary Fudge have made it clear that we have to continue our dedication and focus on helping as many homeowners as possible who are struggling because of the pandemic to keep their home. So just recently instituted additional forbearance um, and relief measures for our struggling homeowners, including seniors with mortgages um, through our reverse reverse mortgage program. And so while we're rightly focused on FHA bars um, and the nation's recovery from the pandemic, we at HUD are act, uh, also acutely aware that, that we must address the systemic barriers to achieving fairness and equity. And I'm proud of the work that we're doing at HUD um, to address the racial equity gap. Um, I know that we have much more to do um, and that, you know, and, and, and this has to be, I mean, this is today's, I, I think today's uh, a part of today's conversation and every conversation that we have going forward as, as an industry about sustainable home ownership. So with that in mind, I very much look forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Lopa. Uh, Mark, would you like to make opening remarks? Sure thing. Uh, like Lopa, the Bureau has been fairly focused on COVID-19 and its impact and mitigating that wherever we can. We've modified our servicing rules. We've made a major outreach push to folks. And I think that will remain our focus through the end of the year. As we go into 2022, we'll, we'll, we'll start to pivot and start to think about how we recover in a sustainable way from the pandemic, what we can do to promote access to credit, sustainable credit. And uh, some of the things we'll be looking at is our QM rule, which we have you know, changed in December of, of 2020. And that became effective in March. And we're going to see the impact of that on the market. We moved away from DTI and we provided some more flexibility for, for lenders to think about things like cash flow underwriting and other approaches to sort of expand the box in a sustainable way for homeowners while we're prohibiting the practices that are the most harmful, you know, no income, ninja loans, and, and some of the, the, the loan products that we did not want to see return. So we that rule is just into effect. So we're going to impact how that 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 has been rolled out. And I think that'll be a focus of ours into 2022. And if there's any changes we need to make, whether to the price margins or to certain types of housing, like manufactured housing, I think manufactured housing itself will be something we'll be looking at because it's it's a, it's a affordable housing for many folks. And it, it fits into, there's a lot of information gaps there about what exactly happens with chattel loans and, and other types of, you know, whether folks get chattel or, or real property, and that's an area of interest. We're also, Looking at using our tools, we have an Office of Innovation. That Office of Innovation, you know, issued a no action letter for HUD approved housing counselors last year, two years ago now. And that allows them to, to basically to provide pre-purchase counseling and, and have partnerships with lenders without some of the issues around RESPA that were raised to us. 
So we're looking to improve and build upon that because we think housing counselors will play an important role sort of expanding the box and reaching folks to try to build back that home ownership rate. And those are some of our priorities, but uh, I look forward to the conversation to come. And is one other thing I'll just add is something that has increasingly been on our radar is just the impact of climate change on home ownership and how all of us, FHFA, the, the Bureau, FHA have to sort of look at that issue as it impacts you know, increasing numbers of Americans and the properties they buy and, and what should be disclosed and, and how we handle that issue, I think will be important. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And Ted, would you give us some opening remarks? Thanks so much, Ann. Uh, thanks also to David and uh, for NHC for bringing all this, uh, everyone uh, together today. It's great to be on the panel. Um, uh, and it's been great actually being uh, watching the panels uh, earlier in the day as well. Um, I'm just going to uh, list a couple of things to start with, and I think we'll get into more uh, things that FHFA is doing with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as the discussion goes on. The first point I think I have to make is I think that that um, FHFA really is in a place right now and has been for a few months where it really is refocusing on the mission elements of Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's charter. Um, and uh, a number of you probably uh, were able to hear uh, the director talk earlier today. Her background is uh, extensive and distinguished in safety and soundness uh, at the FDIC. Um, but she brings really a unique perspective, I think, for someone with that kind of background into um, uh, the importance of mission and affordable home ownership and balancing that uh, with safety and soundness. Um, she's also very focused on sustainability of those mortgages. If you saw, again, if you saw her this morning, she talked about her own experience and saw the damage uh, that uh, non-quality mortgages can cause uh, on households. So uh, as she refocuses uh, the agency on affordable housing and on the situation that we're in right now, um, all of those are her priorities. So two things I'll just mention to start with, as I said, to um, uh, uh, which are, are among the largest things we've done. Uh, first is the equitable housing finance plan which some of you may have seen, this is uh, a requirement that FHFA uh, has, um, has put on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to develop three-year plans on, uh, focused on uh, the racial home ownership gap and what those challenges are, what steps Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can do to try and uh, to address the challenges um, what the, what, how they will measure of those things, and then they'll be reporting um, each year on the plans. Uh, the first year plans are supposed to focus on the racial home ownership gap and also on servicing formerly redlined areas. Um, uh, we've had, uh, we had a listening session uh, on uh, seeking input on the plan uh, earlier this week. I think we had 19 speakers. We have a request for input. Uh, uh, that we uh, put out uh, where people can, can comment on what they think should, uh, things that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should include in their plans. That I think is available until October 25th. Um, what these really are, I think, is a requirement for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to consider and really more than consider focus on uh, racial homeownership, uh, racial gap and homeownership issues in their business planning and strategic planning long term. Um, we don't know what those what will be in those plans. They are up to them to develop, but we do have a pretty rigorous set of specifications for what they should include. Um, and I think uh, while both companies, I think are focused on the issue, we think this focuses them uh, even more. And I think the, the oversight, um, which is frequent and will be ongoing, uh, will, will um, Oh, they'll take it even more seriously than they were. The other thing I will mention is um, the proposed housing goals rule uh, that FHFA published in August. And I will um, resist my temptation to get too far into the details on this. But um, just quickly on housing goals, the housing goals have been around quite a while now. Uh, uh, they have been uh, talked about and written about actually quite a bit over the years. I expect most people on this call have probably heard about them in one form or another. Um, 
But what they really are, I think, essentially, again, is a requirement um, or is a way that the regulator can focus Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac on the specific categories of affordable housing that are listed in the law. Those are low-income households, very low-income households, low-income refinances. Um, and with, uh, if we set those goals correctly, then again, both companies incorporate those, um, all those categories into their strategic planning. If they come to FHFA and have, uh, are proposing a change in their automated underwriting system, um, they have to include an analysis of what the impact of the change would be on low-income households. Um, the same thing if they're changing terms of business or things in their selling guide or what have you. Um, so it really does create a focus. We have never had a housing goal before um, focused on minority areas. Um, there is a part of, a, of an existing goal in the statute uh, that focuses on minority areas. It's combined with, with a number of other elements, um, one of them being disaster areas, all of them being worthy, but it made it difficult to focus specifically on minority areas. What we did was, was break all those categories up and do them individually. And so, um, you know, this is a proposed rule. I really look forward to the comments. But the idea is now that that same kind of analysis and that same kind of strategic thinking will be focused on minority areas. So I will stop there. I think there's a number of other things again under the themes that I that I started with, but I just uh, will start off with those two. Thank you, Ted. Um, I'm particularly excited about the focus on minority home ownership as part of the housing goals process. When I joined Fannie Mae hmm, almost 25 years ago, there was the senior executive who said, you are what you measure. Mm -hmm. And if the enterprises are required to measure their performance in this area, they will perform. Um, it, it will make a difference. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. But um, all of y'all have touched on what I think is a key issue for our industry, which is that the mortgage finance industry often acts as if our country and our families are people in a 1960s sitcom. And that's not actually, that isn't my household, it's not your household, it's not the world we live in. Um, so what can and what should and what are FHA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac doing to actually build a mortgage finance system that reflects the country we have? That's to me really critical. Uh, so I want to turn to LOPA because FHA has a number of products that are accessible, starting with uh, HECMS, as she talked about, uh, because we have a rapidly aging population that has credit needs. So LOPA? Um, and so thank you so much for that question. I mean, I think it's an important one. Um, I think it's one that the uh, mortgage industry as a whole, as you say, um, must address. I mean, I think that we've collectively made a lot of progress over the years. Um, but I think we need to recognize that, um, recognize, as you say, the non-traditional um, uh, uh, characteristics, the non-traditional family structure. Um, and uh, it's really, I mean, these are attributes um, that, we've, that we see in, in many communities of color, right? And so um, this goes straight to the home ownership gap that exists in our society. Um, you know, I know that you all know these numbers, but it's always good to hear them. And I think um, the National Capacity, which is the National Association of um, the Coalition of uh, um, Asian American um, Community Development Organizations, I mean, they've indicated, and we know that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are um, by far the fastest growing segment of the population. And so, and, but they do have lower, they still trail in terms of home, lower home ownership rates, 54% um, um, and uh, to 66% white. And, and, and we also know that Latino and homo, Latino homeownership rates continue to, to, to grow, but are still trailing, um, you know, and, 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 and the rate of Latinos of the Guatemalan, Dominican and Honduran descent have, have homeownerships well to, below 32%. So that housing gap has, has, has been exasperated in recent years, even under the, 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 COVID, the COVID pandemic. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this administration is dedicated to removing the barriers um, to home ownership, uh, uh, especially to communities of color, which which have persisted for so for so uh, 
far too long. So a couple of um, sort of global um, things that we're doing. I mean, Secretary Fudge has convened a racial equity task force at HUD, um, which is taking a top to bottom look at all of HUD's policies, including FHA policies, to see where we can adjust, enhance, and begin to expand and to remove, to expand to be able to remove some of these barriers. Um, one of the things that you probably heard about is Secretary uh, Fudge also chairs with Ambassador Rice, um, the interagency task force to address appra appraisal bias in the home buying process. So that's something that's been just recently launched and we expect results from, from that task force to be starting to, to come, come through. Um, we are pursuing, I mean, our focus has always been on home buyer, first home, first, uh, first, uh, first time home buyers. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we have, as I mentioned, a lot to do. And at, at, at FHA, we continue to pursue first time, first generation homeowner demonstrations that will expand homeownership opportunities for communities of color. Um, you mentioned um, and the um, the Heckums. Uh, the, 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 the Heckums are a, a unique product. Um, it's a product that we have. Um, these are products that, um, well, let me start out by giving uh, some background. And I think the reason we mentioned this is because we are talking about one vulnerable population. We're talking about a population that is um, a, not a doesn't have traditional um, um, the traditional attributes. The Joint Center um, at housing uh, for housing studies um, estimates that by 2050 um, that the population of individuals who are 65 and older is going to double, right? So um, there you go. I mean, this is a, a, what do we do for housing in this area? So FHA ensures reverse mortgages under its HECM program, which is for seniors um, 82 and older. And so, as I mentioned, this program fills a unique role in the national mortgage market and offers, um, I think, uh, we think, critical opportunities for the nation's seniors to, to be able to utilize their own assets and resources to preserve their quality of life by aging in place. Um, and so for those of you, and, and many of you who have actually followed the program's history, um, we have, um, you know, we've had, uh, we have and will continue to refine the program. Um, to ensure its long-term viability. We have focused on, um, on, on, on making um, many programmatic enhancements over the year. This year, uh, just this week, actually, I think just yesterday, we actually um, put our um, heck of handbook onto our drafting table. And so we look forward to the industry feedback in, in, in that area. Um, so these are really changes that we're making in this space to protect seniors. And I think one of the things that we just right, have to recognize is this is different than a traditional forward mortgage. I mean, it's vastly different. It requires a different set of considerations and risk mitigants and um, and, and financial modeling. Um, and I think that um, what's happening in the pandemic is we see that heck and bars are, many um, are struggling to make their taxes and insurance payments. So, so many of the relief options that we've offered um, as part of our COVID recovery um, waterfall and policies have also included HECMs. And so, um, and then finally, I would say that we, um, I know we're going to talk somewhat about housing counseling and the importance of that, um, can't be more fundamental, again, for, for, um, for FHA's HECM program. You know, I think that we need um, uh, to support seniors to be able to make informed decisions, right, about, about, their, about their housing options. So they need to know that the, the HECM or what kind of, you know, product works, works best, for, best for them. Thank you, Lopa. Uh, Mark, you briefly talked about one of my favorite housing types, which is manufactured housing. It is such a it plays such a critical role, particularly in the part of the country I grew grew up in, the Deep South, as can be very good, safe, decent, affordable housing for many households. But mortgage finance is hard. Ted also has responsibilities in this area because. If, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have a duty to serve that explicitly uh, targets the manufactured housing community needs. So Mark, Ted, let's talk about manufactured housing and how it's financed today and what we need to be thinking about. Yeah, I'll just start with, we uh, issued a report this summer that used Humda data, the new Humda data for the first time to look at who got manufactured housing and who got chattel loans, who, you know, the, the ownership of the land underneath that, and, and it revealed a lot of interesting things, some of which we knew, you know, folks who get manufactured housing loans have lower incomes, lower credit scores. In many cases, what they're paying for their manufactured housing is like lower than what any rent would be, you know, so they're, they're, they're a certain spectrum of the housing market that's key. But there isn't a lot of information about how decisions are made about what type of financing when you go onto that lot and you buy your manufactured house about whether you get a chattel loan or you get a title to this property, 
and, and what sort of education process occurs before you make that decision. And I think that's something the Bureau is interested in because we think manufactured housing is gonna be a key part of the mix going forward. You know, supply is gonna be key. All we do on access to credit, you know, doesn't matter if there's not gonna be enough supply, more access, you know, though you can increase the access to credit without increasing the supply, you're just gonna push up prices further. So I think we all should think about the levers we can do to sort of work on the supply side of the equation and manufactured housing, I think is gonna be key. And I'll turn it over to Ted there. Yeah, I agree all the, uh, with all that. I recommend reading the report for those of you who haven't. Um, um, you certainly have. Uh, just, uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, I talked about housing goals. Duty to serve is another program that is in statute for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It requires them to um, uh, sort of provide liquidity uh, and sort of develop underserved markets, which tend to be these very difficult markets in manufactured housing, rural housing, and affordable preservation. Um, so they are they are very difficult problems. Um, uh, you know, one additional, and, and I echo everything that, that Mark said, one additional thing where, where we have had, uh, I'll mention we have had some successes in manufactured housing communities, uh, where uh, one of the things that we did in duty to serve was in order to get credit um, in duty to serve, uh, uh, manufactured housing communities have to uh, have um, tenant protections uh, for, uh, for the, the people who um, you know, own their units and rent their pads. That's something that uh, I think we were, something we were, um, we thought was an important priority, but we really were not sure what kind of uh, take up the industry would have. Uh, we were concerned about it and I think it's gone, uh, it's gone very well. And um, it's something that uh, where I think the, their purchases have taken off. So, so um, anyway, I would just, leave it at that. And can I just jump in about the manufactured housing? Just a yeah. couple of comments that um, that um, Mark had mentioned as well is I think it's absolutely right. I mean, there's the, the credit side, which um, we're looking at and working on defining sort of uh, some of our products um, to expand credit in this area. But I think the supply side is, is, is just as, as critical. And um, the Office of Housing Manufactured Housing within, within HUD is one that actually um, oversees the National uh, Manufactured Housing Construction and Safety uh, Codes. Um, and one of some of the things that we're seeing in the industry are constraints on the supply side, um, you know, particularly in the area of, of, of lumber and, and, and now even um, you know, some other, some other um, areas in copper and steel. Um, and so certainly we are uh, working actively and using that lever to be able to make sure that that um, to the extent that we can provide waivers in those areas um, for the industry and for installers, uh, we wanna be able to do that. So we're, we're taking a, a role, um, I, I mean, I think this is a, is a, is a high priority for, for the administration. Um, I think it's a, I mean, it's a high priority, I know for, I mean, for, for HUD and, and we're gonna be focused both on the supply as well as the credit side. And so um, I think we, we will work alongside, we do work alongside of CFPB and the other agencies and, and, and the GSEs to make sure that, that we can make some headway in this space because I think it's, it's critical. Thank you. Um, in the 60s sitcom that is the mortgage finance world, um, the way everyone gets their, their first home is actually because they've got a rich father-in-law who gives them the down payment. And again, that's not the country we live in and shouldn't be the way, it, to my mind, that people have an opportunity at home ownership. So then we have to look at high loan to value lending. If you don't have someone to give you a big gift to get started, uh, what are the risks around high loan to value lending? What can we do to mitigate them? What sort of performance is FHA seeing on its book? Um, uh, and and Lopa talked briefly about the impact of housing counseling as one of the, the mitigants uh, for the risk that you sometimes see around high loan to value lending. Uh, so Mark, do you want to wait in on um, a high LTV as a, a risk factor? and? Uh, then let's start a conversation. Yeah, I think when we were doing the QM rule, we looked at all the sort of factors that feed into mortgages and, and, and no one fact, factors to, to decides performance entirely. There wasn't DTI that, that had a negative impact on, on particularly low-income and minority folks. There are ways to use compensating factors. 
and you mentioned housing counseling as a mitigant as well. So we've seen high LTV loans perform perfectly well. And FHA's whole book is, <laughs> is a lot of F uh, high LTV loans. And, and I think that's gonna be key going forward. The, the key is to think about underwriting holistically, looking at all the factors, and then thinking about different ways to also underwrite, I think is important as well. You know, making sure we capture the sort of different households that we are now, now dealing with, the, the combined incomes, looking at different ways to document income, not, not document, but to document in different ways. Bank account data can be part of that. And uh, I, I'm very happy to see the Fannie Mae pilot on capturing rent data. I think that's gonna be very important for first time home buyers to be able to sort of give them credit for paying rent, sometimes higher rent than their mortgage in some cities. And, and they do that through bank account data. It's always been a struggle as to getting landlords to report into credit bureaus but they can, they can go back and see 12 months of rent payments. And I think that's, that, that's a positive sign and something the QM rule anticipated and wanted to see more of using these different ways to document income and the like. Ted, uh, what sort of uh, work are you doing at FHFA around uh, evaluating credit and different ways to evaluate credit? Well, I think, you know, uh, Picking up on Mark's point, the, uh, the compensating factors are, are the, uh, certainly a, a big part of it. That, those are conversations we have frequently as we have those conversations with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac around uh, changes in their automated underwriting systems or, or things of that nature. Um, I, I, you know, on counseling, um, you know, I, I think I, I, I can't say enough really about counseling. Uh, and its importance, uh, especially in this kind of market. Um, you know, for one thing, uh, it is, you know, I, I think FICO score, difference in FICO scores between uh, black families and whites uh, is a major contributor to, to the home ownership gap. Um, uh, differences in uh, the amount of uh, people who have credit histories versus those who don't is a major contributor. And, and um, working with counselors is, is extremely uh, uh, helpful in, in those kinds of things. Uh, I will point out, certainly working with a counselor is, is, uh, is, much easy, is much more effective in markets where there is affordable housing, where there's a, a match between the prices and the income. Um, but you know, it's through your relationship with a local counselor that you that you learn uh, that, and where you would learn where the affordable housing might be. Um, one other point I would say, that one thing that we're I think encouraging and that, that we've seen research on, I expect a number of people have, is with respect to down payment, is what is the you know trade off in terms of effectiveness of uh, using savings for down payment versus using it for reserves. Um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, things that Fannie and Freddie, um, that we are encouraging them to work on. Um, again, agree with, with Mark's point that there are other ways of measuring credit worthiness and that we need to build out the capacity of, uh, of the models that we have, uh, but also a question, you know, like that, you know, how th that is additional research that they could do, again, uh, you know, between down payment and, um, and reserve. So those are all those are I'm sort of uh, jumping all over the place there, but those are sort of a number of things that, that there are conversations going on about. Yeah, I'm so glad you talked about the importance of uh, home buyers having money on hand to weather the storms of owning a home, uh, because it, the, one of the challenges of home ownership is that it can be very lumpy. Uh, all of a sudden your hot water heater goes out, your roof has a problem and you need real cash. Uh, and so while I appreciate the, the value of having more equity in a home, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, having cash in your pocket, I think far exceeds um, the value of a big down payment in terms of mortgage sustainability for ordinary households. So happy to hear you talk about it. Uh, Lopa, I, I know, oh, go ahead, Mark. Just want to say, I put a link to a JP Morgan Chase uh, Institute paper that was just on this. They said having three months of liquidity was more important than than a big down payment for 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 performance long term. And I so it, it, it's it's I'm very excited to see that. Um, and 
somewhat along the same lines, uh, when I was at Fannie Mae, one of the economists did some excellent research about the performance of uh, loans uh, in multi-adult households, where there was perhaps a single person owned the mortgage, um, but that there were multiple adults in the household who contributed to the financial stability of the house. There were working grandparents who lived there. There was a partner to the, uh, uh, the person on the mortgage. Uh, sometimes there were adult children. And uh, the research showed that those households way outperformed the credit score of the individual mortgage uh, person on the mortgage because of the diversification of income and the commitment of multiple adults in a family to keep that household uh, and keep that house as an important asset. Uh, so look at having institutions like Fannie and J.P. Morgan Chase looking at um, uh, this type of different performance that doesn't necessarily match the, the mortgage industry box is exciting. Uh, Lopa, y'all, y'all, uh, FHA has an office of housing counseling. Talk to me about housing counseling and and how it's working for y'all right now. Yeah, no, I think that um, I think we have alluded to it in the conversation, and I think it is it can't be emphasized enough that it um, housing counsel housing counseling is 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 critical to sustainable, um, you know, home ownership. I think one of the things that that we've learned is that that housing counselor our housing counselors have have um, have, have taken a much more expanded expanded role, um, particularly as it relates to the to, relates to the to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I think generally, it, based on research and, and and analysis, I mean, we know that that the that, that what we've learned and what we know is that both home buyer education and and high touch service servicing. You know, can and and does make an impact, and and I think that um, home buyer education um, with home buyer education. I mean, so essentially, a HUD certified housing counselor can can be the best resource, um, and it's a resource that sometimes is overlooked um, in discussions like this because we really need to be talking about broader access to information and particularly to to, to individuals and populations that are difficult to reach, right? And so. Um, the, our housing counselors have been some of the best sources of guidance for home buyers and for homeowners. Um, you know, they're part of a trusted um, community of intermediaries um, that are um, that are rooted in communities. And so, um, uh, we have you know not just geographically uh, focused, um, but also um, you know in, in, in particular demographics. Um, so we are asking our counselors now um, to to. To, to be much more um, nimble and to be much more agile, you know, in their scope of services that they're providing to their compli uh, to their clients. Um, so they're performing services that not only are on based on on, on pre and and post homeownership counseling, but we're asking um, homeowners to understand what their options are to avoid foreclosure, um, you know, um, as they are um, coming off of forbearance. Um, you know, they've got to understand their options. We want to make sure that we get them into sustainable um, loan modifications. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, it's on the homeownership side, but then it's also the rental side as well. We want to help families find rental housing. We want to be able to avoid eviction. And, 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 and I, I mean, that's the rental piece, but if our renters are going to, if some of our renters are going to become homeowners, well, we certainly want to make sure that we're supporting them in, in that space um, as they may make, uh, you know, kind of may cross over to, to the home ownership space. So that's going to be an important piece. And then the other piece that we're faced with, um, you know, right now in the fall uh, hurricane season is disasters, right? So many of our borrowers are, are, are victims or, you know, have fallen, um, are struggling in a disaster. So our, our counselors have to be focused on that. So one of the things that we've done is brought together kind of a task force or, you know, team of individuals that have gone down to the Louisiana area who are working very closely with those those who were impacted by hurricane um, by the hurricane down there? So, um, you know, so that's 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 critical. I think the piece when we talk about communities of of color, um, we talk also about um, uh, offering culturally sensitive, um, linguistically appropriate services, um, and then we talk about you know face to face to the extent that that's possible, but you know telephonic and 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 virtual sessions now, right? Um, you know in, con in conjunction with uh, with online educational tools. So um, you know the, the face to face occurs, but we've had to expand it. You know given given um, sort of given the environment. 
Um, so I think that this has got to be at the forefront of, of the discussion. Um, and I think that um, the counselors, we have asked, one of the things that we've done is, you know, we have our single family products, but but our, I, you know, it's great that, 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 that the both the housing counseling area and the single family area is kind of within my purview because we got to keep making sure that they're talking together and that they're actually working in tandem with each other in communities. Um, and that's what's really starting to happen. And, and, and I'm excited about that and looking forward to the impact that we can make on the ground in that respect. So climate change, uh, you talked about going to Louisiana and, and disaster recovery. I, I went to college and law school in New Orleans and uh, represented fishermen uh, right after law school. And a lot of the communities I worked in are gone. Uh, people's houses are gone. People whose houses weren't waterfront are now in waterfront housing, but the road out of that community is gone. How do we think about climate change in the context of sustainable mortgages and what, what should we be doing? Mark, what, what are y'all thinking about? We just started this process, but uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting data that's coming out. Uh, there's this website called Flood Factor where you can look at properties and see their risk of, of flooding over time. And it's more than just the theme of flood zones, right? So you can look at the, the bigger picture here. And I've talked to some lenders who are interested in saying, what should we disclose you know, to a consumer? So at least they're empowered to make a decision when they're entering into the, what is a long-term financial arrangement in, in places where there may be significant risk of damage and you know you may not be required to get insurance because it's not in a FEMA flood zone, but still at risk. So I think these are some of the issues we're thinking about. I mean, we're not a safety and soundness regulator, we're more on the consumer side. So we're thinking about what disclosures are appropriate and, and what information could help a consumer as they make these decisions. I think though, to be clear, every regulator I've talked to in Washington, they're talking about this now. This is of interest, like what will the, well, if you're making 30 year mortgages, what will the, the, the world look like in 30 years? So it's, it's an interesting question. Ted, what, uh, where's FHFA on this? Cause it's a hard balance between pulling liquidity back from communities that are at risk. Um, I don't know what the right answer is there. Yeah. And I, I um... I mean, it's. Uh, I would describe it similar to to the way Mark started off. We are we are uh, looking at it, but we're we're still early. Um, we did, you know, look. We uh, issued a uh, we had advance notice of proposed rulemaking uh, at the end of last year. We got numerous comments on that. We had listening session uh, just in terms of process. Uh, we've reached out. Obviously, we've talked to Fannie and Freddie, but a number of other uh, in the industry and. Um, but we are, so we're, you know, that's, we are starting out really as well with, with all the uh, kinds of concerns that Mark outlined, but that, that's where we are at the moment. Thank you. Really helpful. Um, Lopu, you talked about uh, increased delinquencies with the pandemic. What are you seeing and what tools are you deploying to help people stay in their homes? Yep, this has actually been a, um, uh, I think the highest uh, priority. I mean, one of the things that we've said since we, um, since I landed and since a new administration has come on is that we are focused on addressing the, you know, the, the immediate needs of those that have been, been impacted by the pandemic. And, and we do have um, and continue to have um, 700,000, approximately 700,000 um, FHA borrowers that are in delinquency. Um, we are beginning to see those um, numbers go down a bit, which is which is good. Um, I, I think I mentioned earlier that we have put in a set of um, uh, uh, we have uh, rolled out or we have actually um, put forth um, new policy in June of this year, which is our revised um, COVID recovery waterfall, which which um, provides uh, borrowers uh, provides lenders with the ability to provide borrowers um, the deepest levels of, of payment reduction po possible uh, down to about 25% of the payment reduction. So certainly, um, uh, you know, uh, th these are tools that we've actually put in, put in place. Um, it's still early. These, um, you know, these, these new tools won't be operationalized, aren't expected to be operationalized until um, October. Having said that, services and lenders are beginning to take advantage of them. We're seeing that that um, that um, borrowers are actually, um, you know, uh, starting to come off of forbearance. Um, they're working with their housing counselors to then get in touch with their servicers um, to enter into loan modifications. It's going to take some some time, 
um, to do so. But we we believe that the tools that we've rolled out, um, you know, in 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 uh, some of this work, a lot of this COVID related work on the on on some of our um, uh, waterfall has really been led from from the White House in conjunction and in partnership with our other. Um, agencies who have similar products, right? The USDA and, U um, US, uh, and VA, we've been working with FHA, and of course with Mark and his team over at CFPB. So um, we, I think we're, we're, we've put some tools in place and now we have to, it's a little early, but I think we would, you know, we expect to see some, um, some good outcomes from it. Um, so the hope is that, um, you know, at some point the pand pan pandemic will, um, you know, be, um, Beyond us, but but for now we're focused on and figuring out how to get our FHA borrowers into um, into sustainable uh, loan modification options so that they can retain their homes. I mean that's that's the biggest priority. Uh, Mark is Chief Homeownership Preservation Officer. Do you do you have lessons learned, favorite tools, things that didn't work? Well, I think thankfully I think we did learn a lot from the last crisis. I mean, so many of the same people. In, you know, who are involved in housing finance at VA and at USDA and FHA are, are still around. And we all talk to each other, at the GSEs and FHFA. And I remember after the last crisis, we did have a lessons learned type of process where we realized that, you know, payment reduction was key. And that's part of what LOPA has been doing over at FHA and, and focusing on waterfalls that are sim simple. I mean, the streamlined loss mitigation waterfalls that almost every agency has implemented was a huge increase, I mean, improvement over the last time. If anyone remembers HAMP and, and, and the packages and the fax machines and the lost documents and, and the never ending nightmare that that was that. So I think we've learned stuff from the last crisis and we'll have to learn stuff from this one too. So I'm hoping once we're on the other side of this, we will we'll get together again and say, what do we need to change about the servicing rules? What do we need to change about waterfalls going forward? What tools do we need for disasters in particular? This has been sort of a national level disaster that occurred. And we use some of the same tools, forbearance with streamlined options on the back end to, to fix it. I've been reviewing our complaints, you know, as part of our process, we take complaints. And so we get thousands of complaints each month, folks. And it is still early, as Lopa said. I mean, I think something like 500,000 folks will be reaching their maximum forbearance this month and next month. So this is the crunch time. But uh, the process seems to be going smoother than the last time around. But there are problem spots, private loans. There are some investors out there who seem to have very few options. So you've entered into forbearance for 12 or 18 months. <laughs> and then you know you, your only option is to, to do a repayment plan or something that increases your payment greatly. And that's gonna be problematic for a lot of consumers. So I encourage housing counselors and consumers to please uh, use our complaint line and report servicers who are providing less than uh, perfect solutions. But I'll let other folks talk. Thank you. Um, one other ask on that, though, were there things you tried uh, at Treasury that you were sure were, were going to be the answer and just fail spectacularly? That you don't <laughs> share here with your friends. We won't tell anyone else. Well, I mean, there is a lot of things that we have to, I mean, we're, we're, we're rolling out the Housing Assistance Fund now, and that is based in part on the hardest hit fund. That had a long lead time to get up and running, and I am worried about the ability of Housing Assistance Fund to get up and running too. I think it's something where we're going to all have to pitch in and, and, and make sure it's up to speed and make it as simple and as standardized as possible. Part of the problem with the last crisis was there were so many different variations of mods and programs. Consumers were very confused. And one of the pushes after the last crisis was one mod. Let's have one mod across GSEs, FHA, you know, something simple that consumers could understand. And I think we moved toward that direction. Uh, but uh, we still you know, I worry with what's coming forward that we return to a Tower of Babel type of situation where there's many solutions out there. Consumers are going to get different answers depending on what state they live in, what servicer they have, who backs their loan, you know, so that, that's confusing. Ted, what are you seeing at Fannie and Freddie in terms of delinquencies and, and solutions for consumers? Uh, I don't know that I can really add. Uh, much to uh, what Mark said. I think we're, we're sort of, uh, hopefully, it, I think we are in touch with Mark and, and the CFPB in terms of uh, how to respond this time, but uh, it just um, working through trying to figure out um, uh, those issues for Fannie and Freddie. 
a lot of material here and a lot, a lot of uh, food for thought here. Um, One thing that, um, and I just want to jump in. I think, and I don't know if this was, uh, you know, I wasn't um, in, well, it's kind of tangential to the, to the, when, when, when we were going through this the first time, but I will say what has been really great. And I don't know if, um, if, if Mark and uh, Ted agree is this, Kind of one government approach. I mean, I feel like we are working so closely together. I mean, just even in terms of implementation of half and kind of understanding, you know, where, you know, we're able to work very closely with with Mark and the Treasury team to be able to figure out, okay, let's bring the housing finance agencies together. Let's think about where the FHA delinquent mortgages are, and let's try to map these pieces. And so it's a very focused, targeted approach, which, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I think um, that kind of partnership and that work. That interagency work is really critical to 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 to, to making um, you know an impact and moving the needle in some of these areas. I couldn't agree more that this has been a big, even proven over last time. I mean, I was in charge of the hardest hit fund the last time, and I had to go out to, <laughs> to the agent by myself. Now the White House is there, and all the agencies are together in one room, and it and it, it feels far more like we're in a coordinated fashion working to solve what is a big problem together. So. That is positive. No, I'll just, I'll just. That's a really great point, and and uh, I think that plays out in a number of ways. I, I think there's no question. Uh, I've been at FHFA for a while. I think we are engaged with different agencies in the administration uh, in a very different way, uh, and it is much more coordinated uh, that way. The, you know, the MOU with HUD is one example. It was a sort of a visible one. Um, I think David said this morning he was sort of surprised that there wasn't one already or that one was even needed, but um, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a real difference. I agree with that. Let's shift directions a little bit and talk about appraisals because mortgage sustainability also depends on having uh, good appraisals. Uh, and um, I, I think we're all aware of some of the challenges with uh, getting it right uh, with appraisal bias. Uh, with getting good appraisals in communities that uh, are different. Um, who wants to wade in on this? Mark? I'll just start. I, I, you know, we are part of the task force that HUD is leading on appraisal bias. I think there's a, a secondary issue of, of AVMs and, and how they should be also part of the solution and also how they should be regulated. I mean, you know, they're, they're is a question about how to make sure AVMs don't extend bias in some sort of automated algorithmic way. So there is a rulemaking that all the agencies are part of. They're, they're, they'll be looking at that as one part of it. And I think, but AVMs also play a great role sort of as a check to appraiser bias, I think. You know, so it's one of those things that you have to have a balanced approach. But this is a big issue for the Bureau. We've been focused on it. You know, it's been in the headlines where minority neighborhoods, you can get appraisals that are noticeably lower than the sales price. There's been multiple studies on that. And it, you know, some of it is going to be because some neighborhoods are the, the price variation is far greater. And that makes it tricky, even for AVMs. But uh, I think this is a problem that we're all going to be focused on. I've also been particularly interested in the impact of appraisals in rural areas yeah. because comps don't look the same. When you're and you can't do AVMs in some of those areas either, so. Yeah, uh, which continues to make access to credit hard for particular communities. Um, well, let me ask if our panelists want to give any closing thoughts or if there are topics you really wanted us to talk about that we didn't cover. Uh, I will. I started last time with LOPA, so, so I will circle back and start with LOPA again. So I know I will just um, say that I think that um, from FHA's perspective, uh, you know, I think that we have, you know, we'll continually find the right balance between with, between mission and risk. Um, we are absolutely focused on on advancing um, uh, racial equity, and so everything that we do at FHA is through the racial equity lens, um, with the idea of just breaking down the barriers um, for first time first time home buyers first-time home buyers and, and those um, families and individuals and communities of color. And so, 
Um, we, you know, we're, we've done some of that, um, but I think we have a lot more to do. Um, we're going to have to evolve, um, you know, to meet those changing needs, right, of those of those non traditional borrowers and. And I think that some of that we will, you know, do with the strong housing counseling. Some of it we'll do with some innovative uh, uh, pilot demonstration projects, uh, development uh, pilots. You know, um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is low balance loans. You mentioned low rural areas, uh, low cost areas. I mean, that's something that we need to look at. Um, small mortgage loans. Um, and so I think trying and testing those uh, products are going to be important uh, for us at FH. I mean, our, our, our mission is to, to, to address the, the needs of, of low and moderate income families. And, and so we're the ones that really need to try and test those. And so uh, we plan to be at the forefront. We're not there yet, but we'll, I think we'll get there. And it's, you know, like I said, we have to evolve with, 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 with the, um, in, me, in terms, if we want to move the needle in, these, in this area, we want to show outcomes in the area, then, then we, we, we've got to do that. And, and we're committed to doing so. Thank you. Kath, do you have any final remarks? I think two things. Um, uh, you know, I described uh, just a couple of things, I think, uh, earlier um, in terms of the equity plan and the housing goals. There are a number of other things. We are, uh, the housing goals is a proposed rule. Uh, the comment deadline is October 25th. Uh, I think the, uh, the comment deadline for the equity plan is the same date. But I would just encourage people to, there are many, many opportunities to comment on um, plans from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, through FHFA, or there are listening sessions, there are requests for information, there are proposed rules. Um, I really, really encourage people to do that. Um, we do read them, we do listen to them. Um, I don't think there would have been a minority areas goal, uh, but for comments that we got on what we call advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on, on the housing goal last year, which pointed out um, uh, the problem. Um, so I really do encourage people to do that and, and it really is effective. I think the only other thing I would say is, is I, I am you know, frequently reminded of, of uh, just sort of the um, unique uh, time that we're in. We referred to it um, many times in this panel alone about uh, really I'm talking about the opportunity uh, that's going on uh, to, uh, uh, to start to narrow the home ownership gap. I couldn't be more excited. We couldn't be more energized. As I said, the director uh, frequently says every day counts. I mean, the other thing uh, as I think, and I don't mean to, to douse that at all, but you know, these issues uh, were created over a very, very long period of time, and it will take a very long period of time um, to really uh, uh, to solve them. And I, I am, you know, just encourage everyone, I, I hope, and I'm looking forward to that energy being sustained and you know, all these things that we talk about in terms of Fannie and Freddie, we are trying to embed those things again into the long-term strategic thinking and planning. Um, and, and, and so I, that is something that I do uh, think about and hope for and, and encourage people to, to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Look, I think Lopa and Ted said most of it, but I, I between the two of them, I mean, the GSEs and FHA, you have something like 70% of the mortgage market. <laughs> so there, there is a, that is also an opportunity, like Lopa said, about using pilots and other ways to sort of crack this nut of, of historic low home ownership rates for minorities. And how can we do it in a sustainable way? And then you take the previous conversation about how we're all doing it. And we're talking to each other now. We're not just operating in silos. Because when one does a pilot, it has impacts on other all of us. And so... I think there's that spirit of collaboration. So I'm very hopeful. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the panelists. This has been a lot of fun. I now want to turn it over to Chris Siglin, who is the Vice President for Policy and Partnerships with the National Community Stabilization Trust, uh, my former office mate uh, in one of her previous roles, and uh, really has been a policy and advocacy leader in, the, in Washington for our housing issues for decades. So Chris, thank you for your leadership with today's program. Well, and many thanks to all the panelists. This has been such a hopeful, energizing conversation about such a difficult, longstanding issue. And, and you know, 
you're in the balkanized, factionalized, often not unified housing field, isn't it interesting to hear a day long discussion with a mu as much agreement as we heard today? But I just wanted to, I know you, you all need to get back to your email and thank you for all the attention, but there's a couple points I want to emphasize. Sustainable homeownership is the main driver of generational wealth. Every single spe speaker said this. So if we want to do something about the racial wealth gap in our country, we have to do something about access to homeownership. So there's agreement on the problem. And you know, with a crime, you need both motive and opportunity. So this is what I heard today. I heard the motive that this is a crying injustice and I also heard the opportunity. So here's what I heard of people in agreement, the importance of partnerships. No, not one entity on this webinar today said, oh, my institution can do this all by itself. I can solve this. Nobody said that. Nobody said, oh, there is one size fits all. This one, one little policy change, if we do that, it'll all be solved. Everyone acknowledge the complexity and how we're all gonna to have to work together to change a lot of policies. By the way, shout out to the robust policy conversation in the chat. Um, well, people were way down in the weeds, which you know you gotta love. And um, I would encourage people to look at the Homeownership Alliance website and the National Community Stabilization Trust website. We've got some good materials on homeownership policy matters. But um, I also heard the need for building trust scaling up and intentional policies. So all that seems right to me. So the National Housing Conference is gonna write up this rich discussion and they promised to share the, the, um, the research. The, the, the PowerPoints were terrific and many thanks to Freddie Mac MBA and USMI for, for the, the deep dive. So I would just say, let's use the past failures to do this right this time and create homeownership opportunities with lasting benefits. I mean, if we're going to make increase racial equity and make all neighborhoods into neighborhoods of opportunity, we've got to close the homeownership gap. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and thank you to all of our panelists and participants. Uh, we will be publishing a report on this convening with all the PowerPoints and we'll include answers to the questions that were asked in the Q&A section in the chat. There was a lot of great questions there. Um, and we will be also sending the PowerPoints themselves to all the registrants in the meantime. If you liked your experience with NHC today, please join us at nhc.org. Memberships start at just $50 for our emerging leaders in affordable housing program and scale up from there for nonprofit and for-profit housing organizations. Joining will give you access to our weekly member brief working groups like our new racial equity working group and existing working groups like those on CRA, GSE reform and duty to serve, as well as discounts on our convenings like our annual policy symposium and tickets to our gala, which will be held next June after a two year hiatus, um, even if we have to have a masquerade ball. This year's policy symposium will be held online on October 13th from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will focus on technology and housing and feature a keynote from Deputy Commerce Secretary Don Graves Jr., who led the Treasury Department's housing and community development policy and programs during the Obama administration. Um, as, uh, and um, I'm sure Mark recalls that um, we were partners in good trouble at the time. Uh, as well as experts on artificial intelligence, broadband, credit, and housing production. You can learn more about the Technology Symposium at our website, nhc.org, or click on the link I just put in the chat, um, which I'm going to send to everyone. And uh, thank you again, Chris. Thank you, Wells Fargo, for your generous support. And I hope to see you all at the uh, Tech and Housing Symposium on October 13th. Have a great day. Bye-bye.